the tactical police units, we were using PD Ops 4, and the Sheriff's Office was using uh, the Sheriff's Operations Channel. And my understanding there were also frequencies one and two for units that were not working at the, ra the rally as well, is that correct? Correct, PD-1 is uh, for patrol units that would cover the southern part of the county, and PD-2 would be the, the northern part of the county. And were local officers able to listen to other radio frequencies that day, other than the ones that you just outlined? No, so we were able to hear our Butler County channels only. And could you talk a little bit about the state troopers as well? Um, what frequencies were they listening to? The only thing I can really speak to on the, the state police radio is we did have one in the county command post. It was a uh, portable radio. Uh, but the, the newer radios seem to operate more like a cell phone. And if you don't have a connection to the tower, then they just don't work. Um, so we had some issues hearing anything from that radio throughout the day. So you had issues communicating with the state police, and my understanding is they were on a different radio system from you. Correct, and they are on a separate radio system. Uh, I'm sure Lieutenant can echo better what they actually were using. Do you know if the Secret Service, again, in a different area, was able to listen to your local radio frequencies that day? Uh, so there would have been an encrypted police radio in the command center. Uh, I believe it was being used by the emergency services side, so fire and EMS, but I believe they treated around 250 patients for heat-related stuff that day. So that radio was nonstop. So even if that radio was scanning and had the capability to hear our channels, they would not have been able to do so uh, just because of the amount of traffic yeah, uh, yes, when we were in Butler, that was my understanding is that there were a couple hundred calls because it was such an incredibly hot day and that, it, to your point, even if they had been able to listen to you, there was a lot of other chatter going on. And so, you know, here we've got uh, the local folks, the sheriff, the state police, all of whom have their own channels and not all of whom are able to listen and hear to, uh, one another. Can you briefly talk a little bit about the Secret Service and whether or not you think they could hear you? I do not believe they could hear us at all. Uh, they did not have a radio from us, and we did not have a radio from them. Uh, so, you know, in the local command post, there was no way for us to hear any of the Secret Service radio traffic. So for those of us who are of a certain age, I was in my early mid-20s during September 11th. This was almost exactly what I remember being the problem in terms of responding to sev uh, September 11th, that there were all kinds of really well-intentioned, very well-trained people, um, but none of whom could hear one another or communicate with one another. It feels as though we haven't made a whole lot of progress on that. Uh, in your view, what would have been a better way uh, to have this communication? Sure, it's not feasible to have everybody communicate on the same channel, just because of the amount of radio traffic. Uh, however, a unified command post, uh, as we're all taught in many different FEMA classes, uh, a unified command post solves that issue. Yes, and I know Representative Crow started this conversation with sort of being aghast at the fact that there were clearly more than one command post, and that in some cases, my understanding is some people didn't even know that there were more than one command post, and so that's certainly a gap too. So here we were with three minutes and every second counting and the Secret Service and the state police weren't able to directly hear what local law enforcement actually saw because they didn't have that interoperability uh, with local law enforcement frequencies and didn't have possession of those radios. Uh, given how important that communication is in communicating in a crisis, clearly one of the findings of our, of our investigation ought to be that there needs to be certainly reform in terms of the technological communications that are going on here. Um, my colleagues had a little bit of extra time and with my remaining time I'd like to ask a question about the drones. Uh, I understand that the drone technology that the Secret Service had didn't work that day. My understanding is that the uh, person who was trying to assassinate the former president's technology did work that day. The last question that I have for you is we're always trying to solve for the last problem that we have you know, a, a shooter, a sniper. Uh, to me, we should be solving for the future problems that we aren't seeing coming around the corner, and those are emerging threats, evolving th threats such as drone technologies. Gentlemen, do you have anything that keeps you up at night that isn't sort of the traditional sniper on a rooftop? Yeah, I believe that, that we've probably all considered the emerging threat that would be coming from a drone. Uh, I would say at our level, 
I have no means to mitigate that at this point. And that's actually something that we can also help with, and Congress has uh, pieces of legislation, my, myself included, that address the authorities that you need to have to be able to uh, combat what I think is an increasing threat from things like drones. Uh, I thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you very much again for your service. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, General Lee. The General Lee from Florida. Ms. Lee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this important hearing and to our witnesses for being here with us today. Uh, Lieutenant Harold, I would like to start with you and return to a comment that you made earlier. I believe you testified that you actually participated in a prior rally at this same area with President Trump in 2020. Is that correct? That is correct. And you commented upon your observations about different resources that were available for that 2020 rally. Is that right? That is correct. Would you please describe for us some of the differences you saw in the level of protection and the level of resources that were afforded to President Trump in 2020 that were not part of the rally in 2024? Well, first, the first, it was the site. It was uh, an airport that's loaded, or I mean, located about uh, 20 minutes south of the farm show. So it was an airport. It's completely fenced in. It's a restricted area. The night before, we, we, we picked up the motorcade and, and, and delivered the motorcade, I guess, or escorted it back to the airfield, and we parked it in the hangars there, and everything was secured, but there was no, I guess, the, the foot traffic, there's nobody walking through an airfield, you know, the, it's all fenced in, it's restricted, but it seemed like there was, there was more resources that were, were present for the 2020 rally compared to the, the one here just 75 days ago. So when, when you think of like the level of security then, like what was changed now? Like why did we have less uh, resources from the Secret Service on July 13th? In your observation, did it appear that there were a higher number, a greater number of Secret Service agents involved in the 2020 rally? There, there definitely was, but it could have been because of the motorcade, too. Like, the, I mean, it was uh, formal, former uh, President Donald J. Trump was, was the president then, so there was, it seemed like there was more, more assets, resources, the motorcade. Um, like, it, it, there was definitely more security at the airfield at the Butler Airport compared to the Butler Farm Show. And Mr. Sullivan, I'd like to return to you for a moment. You testified earlier about very extensive and very specific training you received as a Secret Service agent before being put on a protective detail. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. And I believe your testimony was that in addition to specific law enforcement training, you spent years uh, in preparation and training before you actually were on that particular service. Yes, Ms. Lee. That's correct. Now. Other federal agents who may be brought in to supplement Secret Service in a rally such as this, do they receive that kind of training? No. So we've discussed earlier that state and local law enforcement would not and did not have that kind of specialized training. But to be clear, it is also true that other federal agencies don't receive that specific training, that specialized training either. Well, uh, every agent that goes to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center Criminal Investigative Training Program does get an introduction to protection. They do get some uh, familiarity with it. And then before we, in the Secret Service, I'm no longer there, but borrowed agents from other agencies. When I was an agent, we used ATF, uh, IRS, Customs, uh, now it's Homeland Security investigators. They are briefed and they get a briefing and a familiarization with Secret Service procedures. But remember though, the agents that are helping from HSI are not doing the advance. They're not making decisions uh, on how to create the security plan. They're in a specific post with specific post instructions for that post. But would it be correct to say that Secret Service agents who are specifically assigned to a protective detail have far more extensive training in that specific type of service and law enforcement activity than would your counterparts at other agencies? That, that is 100% accurate, Ms. Lee, yes. And are there things in your observation about the particular rally today and the staffing associated with it? Uh, you touched earlier on how it's imperative to include state and local law enforcement, but are there particular things about this rally that you've observed that you think might have elevated and improved the security posture? 
Well, again, Ms. Lee, I wasn't there. I'm just acting on the information I've received in public knowledge. I think there was clearly mistakes made. There were uh, decisions that were not appropriate, in my opinion. And I'm, I'm really appalled at the communications plan, or lack thereof. I can't fathom how that would be acceptable, and it's absolutely not acceptable. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, General Lee. Representative Musk, which you're now recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the assassination attempt against President Trump on July 13th was a chilling moment in our country's history. This task force is committed to ensuring that security failures on July 13th never happen again.